um, we're now going to be giving you another demonstration of uh, uh, the research project which has got significant uh, uh, input from people with lived experience. In fact, we couldn't have done it without people with lived experience. Um, it's ongoing um, and um, we're going to start by Martin uh, describing it and I'll describe some of the issues around uh, uh, that we've had uh, trying to engage people with lived experience and some of the things which we have, I think, done well and some of the things we didn't do too well and uh, how we can do things differently in the future. So, Marna, over to you, mate. Thanks. So, I'll take a few minutes and give a bit of an overview of the idea and the methodology behind the Beacon Study, uh, which is the project that Simon's leading, co-leading, um, involving uh, basically smartphone-assisted problem-solving therapy for men who present to emergency departments having self-harm. Uh, and it's funded by the uh, OSU program, which is the Ontario Score Support. So the, the brief background is that we know in Ontario, approximately 16,000 people present to the emergency department every year following self-harm. Uh, we know also that self-harm has a strong association with suicide. And in fact, um, although the, uh, we need to continue doing research looking at individual risk factors, we know that having self-harm or having uh, attempted suicide is one of the strongest risk factors for eventual death by suicide. Um, one to two percent of people who present in the emergency departments with self-harm die by suicide within a year of their first presentation. What people also aren't necessarily aware of is that people who present to hospital with self-harm are much more likely to die, period to have premature mortality, premature death by any cause, not just due to suicide. Suicide we know about, but a lot of people aren't aware of that. So this, in fact, is a medical emergency, it's a crisis, it's a very severe situation. Um, we also know that data that are available suggest that the sort of care that people receive in emergency departments when they do present with self-harm is highly variable. And we've heard about some of them, either the group of us or in smaller groups over the last couple of days. And as people reflect on some of their own experiences, sometimes the care received is phenomenal, and sometimes, well, it just isn't. Okay. So this is to show, so the, the project, again, specifically focuses on men who present with self-harm. We talked over the last couple of days about risk for suicide among men. Of course, we need to focus on women as well. This particular study focuses on men. So we know that whereas only four out of 10 people who present to the emergency department are men, men are responsible for about <coughs> two thirds of those who die from suicide. Men who present to, uh, with self-harm to the emergency department have risk for death by suicide that's 200 to 300 times that of the general population. So again, as we think about the theme of going to where our communities are, going to where at-risk people, going to where men are. This is one of the places where men who are at high risk for dying by suicide actually do engage the healthcare system and areas where we, we recognize there's improvement that can be had. Um, we know that over the next uh, 12 months or so of presenting to the emergency department following self-harm, about 13% of men in Ontario will come back to the emergency department with another uh, episode of self-harm. And this is just to show at the bottom, across a couple of different hospitals in Ontario, Ottawa General, St. Mike's in Toronto, uh, Victoria Hospital in London, where I am, and Thunder Bay Regional Sciences Centre, that the percentage of those who come back with self-harm a year later is highly variable from about 9% to about 26, 27%. And these include sites that are involved um, in our so uh, to shift for a moment to talk about um, smartphone-assisted problem-solving therapy, uh, it can be considered a blended form of therapy, blending face-to-face -face therapy with electronic or tech, in this case, uh, smartphone application. So blended care is the term that's used for electronic support of psychotherapy and treatment of mental disorders uh, involving either online, web-based, computer-based um, care together with face-to-face -face therapy. And there are various advantages to using blended approaches to care rather than sequential or, or one only. Uh, one, it can increase the intensity of mental health treatment because you've got both the individual level, the daily, as well as the therapist providing support. 
it increases a sense of patient agency because the individual res is responsible for one's own care, is able to access the app as needed, able to adjust and modify uh, the information available on the app to suit their needs, their personality, their, their uh, perspectives, uh, offers case management benefits uh, for mental health professionals and reduction in health care costs. As you see, and, and it, it never fails, whenever you've got a presentation about electronics, the electronics don't work. <laughs> or maybe it's my thumb that doesn't work. So the Beacon study, uh, it's involved in, again, as we're saying, to improve identification and management for men who present to the emergency department following self-harm. Now, it is a cluster randomized controlled trial. So people might be familiar with what a randomized controlled trial is. People are uh, recruited for a study, pass an eligibility assessment often, sometimes not, depending on the situation. They have to be eligible for the study, and then get randomized or randomly allocated, meaning there's some sort of either computer program or other approach to randomly assign somebody to one group or another group. So the fact that so that's the randomized part, the controlled part means that you're not just offering an intervention group, but you're comparing it to something else either a group that doesn't receive a special intervention, receives usual care, or something else. The fact that it is a cluster randomized trial, we know that when people come into, for instance, the same hospital and are randomized, there are going to be some hospital-specific factors. There are going to be community-specific factors. Maybe there's one person doing all the recruiting. Uh, maybe there are uh, factors having to do with the healthcare providers in that particular emergency department that aren't standard across the province. And so we know that there can be side effects, community effects, provider effects, etc. Um, and those are things that you can't necessarily randomize or control for. So with the cluster randomization, what you're doing is you're randomizing not at the level of the individual, but of, in this case, the hospital or the system. So one hospital will provide the intervention, one hospital will be a control. So rather than an individual coming in, getting assigned one way or the other, the choice is made by where you go. So you're basically voting with your feet and you either get to a center that's providing the intervention or one of the control. Um, maybe not the greatest explanation of cluster randomization, but, but it's one. So. Um, so again, the randomization took place at the level of the emergency departments where 10 emergency departments in Ontario are intervention sites where they'll receive smartphone-assisted uh, problem-solving therapy, and 15 control sites where they won't. Um, and part of the issue that the biostatisticians uh, randomized co-varying for were uh, proportion of presentations by men with self-harm, as we saw that was highly variable across the province, location, whether in an urban or rural setting, because we know there are differences there, presence of psychiatric emergency services is important. And we're looking at these particular outcomes, our primary outcomes, proportion of death by suicide. So we're collaborating with ISIS, the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences, to look at Ontario-level health data that will allow us to track deaths by suicide, as well as proportion of people who represent to emergency departments for self-harm. Secondary outcomes looking at people who represent to the emergency department for any issue, recognizing that there are other health issues uh, associated with uh, being suicidal and having engaged in self-harm. We're looking at primary care services overall, mortality for reasons other than suicide for reasons mentioned earlier, and the overall health care costs, because ultimately we would like to see that this intervention improves care, improves access to care, and reduces the cost of the system. And as I mentioned, the study is funded by the Ontario SPORE Support Unit, SPORE, of course, standing for Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research, uh, or OSU, which is a partnership between the Government of Ontario and CIHR. Um, so briefly, the intervention, emergency departments will receive staff training and assessment of self-harm. They'll receive written materials developed by service users for men who self-harm and get access to study-specific electronic referral systems. Participants will receive six sessions of problem-solving therapy, which is an evidence-based uh, therapy that's been found to be highly effective at reducing risk for suicide um, in a variety of trials, really across the world over a number of years. Um, booster session of PST at six months and access to the Beacon smartphone application. 
Um, I will stop at that point and, and throw it over to Simon. If you'd like to tell us a bit more about what we can have, but also tell us about the role of service users in the uh, Thanks, Martin. So the, the idea behind this study is to see whether giving people, a, giving people access to face-to-face -face therapy and a smartphone app is more than the sum of its parts. That, that's the blended therapy bit. Um, that's the bit I'm quite interested in. Um, we did a pilot study of, uh, uh, of, of this, and uh, one of the main things to come out of the pilot study is that people turned up to all their appointments. Um, as a psychiatrist, one of the things I know is that um, after self-harm, people tend not to turn up to their appointments for a variety of reasons, especially men. But in the pilot study, 92% of appointments were, uh, were filled, people turned up to them. Which I think says something about the increased connectivity with the uh, therapist through the app to the men. Because uh, the app, because there is the app on the, on the phone, but also the clinician has a dashboard so you can, so you can do, see all the patients that you're following and you can connect to people in, in between the sessions. So it's this idea of the sum being more than the separate parts. And I think one of the things having the smartphone app in therapy does is increase that sense of connection through uh, through treatment. We'll, we'll see, we'll see if, if that's true in the wider study. But in terms of the specific reason why we're here, which is well, how are people with lived experience involved in this study? Well, to start with, we couldn't have got the money without them. Um, that's part of the that's part of the criteria of this poor funding is that people with lived experience had to be involved in the grant application. Um, 